His new book, The Making of American Buddhism, I highly recommend because he shows a different perspective of how up until now, like at one time I was going to have another friend of mine, Chuck Priebus, talk, but Chuck Priebus is very old. He's probably close to 90. And the, at that time, they weren't really including Asian American groups. But Dr. Mitchell's new book really shows how the Japanese American Buddhist communities really encouraged and helped the white Buddhists become Buddhist. Right? So please listen. And if you have any questions, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, hopefully. And Dr. Mitchell will be becoming the president of IBS in from June. Woo. Is it July 1st? Oh, it's July 1st. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little bit of time. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, is this on? Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Um, thank you, Sensei, for the introduction. I will. Um, what I'd like to do today is, is run through this uh, presentation that I have. It provides an overview of American Buddhism. Um, I'll probably run through it pretty quickly and then have plenty of time for discussion. Um, I always feel that uh, the questions that I get from people um, in these kinds of sessions are way more uh, valuable than just y'all you know, sitting there listening to me politely um, and trying to stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, like Sensei said, you know, uh, Buddhism in America is, um, I think it's important to understand uh, the various traditions of Buddhism in this country. Um, there's a, a sort of well-known uh, stereotype, I guess you could say, that says that every form of Buddhism that exists in Asia has some presence in the United States. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> it probably depends on how you define traditions of Buddhism, um, or even the United States. Um, but I do think because of that, to study Buddhism in America, you really have to have a, an understanding of Buddhism as it exists across Asia, both in the contemporary world, but also historically. And when we really look at Buddhism in America and the various ways that different communities and traditions and, and so on have come to this country, we can learn a lot about not just Buddhism, but also um, the, the larger history of the interaction between the United States and Asia. And also we can learn a lot about American culture. And I think that can help us tremendously as we go out into the world and encounter different people, both other Buddhists who are not Jodo Shinshu, as well as just other people from uh, American culture more generally. <clears throat> so I have this presentation. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna run through it kind of quickly. And then we'll switch over to discussion and uh, Q and A. And I'm happy to talk about the book. Uh, thanks for the plug. Um, go out and buy it. <laughs> um, and we can have a, an open-ended conversation about other issues. Um, hopefully, this works. Well, of course, it doesn't. Is it on the screen? Cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's frozen. Wow, everything's frozen. All right. Did it just totally crash? That's good. Yep, so stop the screen share now, so that's good. <laughs> 
as a last ditch effort, did you want to email me? You don't have to. But... Well, it's this fancy thing that is too fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Is it there back? We yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so great. Uh, the uh, like I said, most all, almost every kind of Buddhism you can imagine has some sort of presence in North America. So how do we figure out how to talk about it? One way to do that is to talk about the the major uh, traditions of Buddhism. Uh, most scholars are going to divide the Buddhist uh, tradition into these three categories of Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. Uh, Theravada Buddhism is the Buddhism that we can find most often in South and Southeast Asia, places like um, uh, Thailand and Sri Lanka. Uh, the Mahayana traditions are mostly in East Asia and Central Asia, and Vajrayana is sometimes referred to Tantric Buddhism and is sometimes um, uh, sort of equated almost entirely with Tibet. Um, this is a sort of a false categorization scheme. <laughs> uh, most Vajrayana Buddhists would actually consider themselves part of the Mahayana, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. For the purposes of this uh, conversation, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to come up with some categories to make life easy. <clears throat> um, so when we talk about Theravada traditions, like I said, these are traditions that come from mostly South and Southeast Asia. There are all kinds of different Buddhist traditions from Theravada um, communities here in the United States. Most of them are relatively new, <clears throat> and this is owing to the fact that for about a hundred years, the United States had a series of anti-Asian immigration laws in place, uh, culminating in the early uh, in the 1920s with an almost total ban of uh, immigration from Asia entirely. Um, so as a result of that, most of the early immigration to the United States came from China uh, for a very short period of time and then Japan for a, a little bit longer. And that's the reason why we have such a strong Japanese um, uh, Buddhist presence in America. The folks who are coming from South and Southeast Asia, however, were subject to this ban of Asian immigration that the U.S. had for a very long time until the mid 1960s. Um, and what happened in the mid 1960s was uh, first uh, President Kennedy before he was assassinated and then uh, Lyndon Johnson had this idea that they were going to change immigration laws to make it easier for folks from Eastern Europe to come to the United States as a way of saying, um, you know, come to the, uh, America because communist Russia is terrible it was all, you know, propaganda stuff in the, in, during the Cold War. But, you know, as you all know, we were kind of involved in something in Southeast Asia at the time <laughs> that resulted in a pretty significant um, uh, refugee crisis heading into the 1970s. So as a result of these changed immigration laws, what we actually see is a huge rise of immigration from Asia, primarily from South and Southeast Asia, during a time when uh, the colonial, European colonial control of that part of the world was falling away and there was a lot of wars and, and, and the, um, the war in Vietnam affected a lot of this. And so this is when we see a sharp rise in immigration from South uh, and Southeast Asia, bringing with it a lot of different uh, forms of te primarily Theravada Buddhism. Now, um, I have a bunch of little circles on here <laughs> um, to sort of point to the unique history. So, for example, Thailand um, is is unique in some ways because unlike other parts of Southeast Asia, Thailand wasn't ever directly colonized by a European or American interest. And so the Buddhist community there is actually still relatively strong, much like the, um, the Buddhist institutions in Japan. There are large Buddhist institutions in Thailand that have connections to the American uh, Thai communities. Um, so there's there's some there's some stories that we could learn there from uh, uh, from just the sort of uh, institutional structures of Thai Buddhism. But we can also trace how different Thai Buddhist institutions show up here in America. Um, Thai Buddhist communities are actually way more um, spread out across the United States, in part because many of them were started um, uh, by the uh, the lay women who happen to marry U.S. servicemen. And so what you'll actually find is, is rather large Thai temples and communities near uh, military bases in places like Texas or, or in uh, Florida. So there's interesting connections like that <clears throat> when we start thinking about different ways in which Buddhist communities come to the United States. Um, 
The situation with Burma or Myanmar is very different because Burma, um, as many of you probably know, has been in, embroiled in one form of civil war or another for a very long time. And so most of the Burmese who come to the United States actually come as refugees. And oftentimes, particularly back in the um, 60s, 70s, and 80s, Burmese who came to the United States would have to come here through some other country. They would escape Burma and go to Thailand or go to China and then come to the United States. And then the United States Immigration uh, Services, being what they are, would um, not count them as Burmese, but count them as Chinese or something else. And so tracing how these communities, uh, uh, the number of, of, of folks from these, these countries becomes kind of difficult. Um, similarly with Laos and Cambodia, because of the communist takeover of, of these parts of the world, the uh, Buddhist communities in those countries were, were more or less wiped out or decimated. And so these refugee communities don't have connections to institutions in the countries where they came from originally. <clears throat> Um, finally, I'll say that also as a result of what was going on in the 1960s, the United States um, started this wonderful thing called the Peace Corps. Um, and that gave people the opportunity to go to South and Southeast Asia um, as uh, workers for the Peace Corps or as tourists or as just people who are interested in, in, in learning about other cultures. That provided the opportunity for people like Jack Kerouac no, not Jack Kerouac. <laughs> Jack Cornfield. <laughs> Jack Cornfield traveled to uh, Thailand when he was a young man and actually became a Theravada monk for a time and then brought Theravada teachings in the form of insight meditation back to the United States. And so folks like uh, Cornfield and other people of his generation in the 1970s started establishing what are now usually called Vipassana centers or insight meditation centers which uh, cater primarily to uh, white converts, but there's a lot of overlap between these communities and um, both the Thai and Sri Lankan communities. Yay, it still works. So I have a quick overview of some important people. I'm just gonna put that up there. Maybe you wanna take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to skip ahead to the, um, of the, to the far more complicated um, discussion about Mahayana Buddhism. Um, like is, I, is there a significance on the size of your bubbles? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a limitation of the software. <laughs> Can you go back to that previous thing? Really this one? My fingers weren't fast enough. To or get the, the this one. There. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Koichi's recording this, and um, you all can see it later, I guess, right? Okay. Say again? Talking to myself, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so as I said earlier, there is, there's a connection between Mahayana and Vajrayana, and this is sort of a, um, a false. Uh, or a, a sort of academic categorization that we use. The reason why we do this is because of the, the, the focus of practice in these traditions. Vajrayana traditions tend to be focused more on what are called tantric practices, mantras, mandalas, um, mudras, other, other forms of practice, esoteric practices. Um, however, the sort of philosophical and doctrinal basis for Vajrayana Buddhism is all Mahayana. And what most Vajrayana Buddhists will say is that there's uh, basically three steps in the practice, um, pre-Mahayana teachings, Mahayana teachings, and then the esoteric teachings. So it's, it's a continuum, not a separate uh, kind of school. But for the, the sake of argument, <laughs> let's just say um, that we'll, we'll look at, at, at Vajrayana as a sort of separate institution. Mahayana, of course, comes primarily from East Asia, um, and in the United States comes mostly from China, Japan, and Korea. Um, the situation with China is complicated. China is complicated <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, there's actually a, a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of Chinese American Buddhism, owing a lot to the long immigration history, as well as the communist takeover of mainland China in the 1950s. So the first Chinese immigrants to America came in the 1840s, 1850s. Many of those communities um, 
uh, did not survive because of the anti-Chinese racism that we see at the end of the 19th century. Um, however, there are actually some uh, communities that did survive. I, uh, my wife actually a couple days ago just sent me an article about Marysville, which is uh, like two hours north of here. Um, and they have a, a, a Taoist temple that probably has some Buddhist influences to it. That's been there since like 1850. It's the oldest or the second oldest uh, surviving temple in um, Chinese temple in California. It's, it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> so there's like, you know, four members of the Chinese community still living in this town, um, you know, holding on strong. Um, they do a um, Chinese New Year's thing every year. So there are some uh, communities that still exist. Um, but for the most part, this first wave of Chinese immigration, there was, um, again, a tremendous amount of anti-Chinese uh, anti racism, as well as tremendous pressure to convert to Christianity. So a lot of these institutions didn't uh, survive into the um, 20th century. <clears throat> um, and then even though we had a um, anti-Chinese immigration law in the book on the books for a long period of time, um, around the time of World War II, we were actually letting Chinese refugees into this country, um, in part because of the, the complex power dynamics between the U.S. and China and Japan. And, you know, we were uh, uh, enemies with Japan, but we were also trying to help China. But then the, the communists were coming. And so, you know, there was a lot of dynamics going on there where we see the beginnings of some refugee communities coming both from uh, mainland China as well as Tibet as early as the 1950s. <clears throat> and then after the, the communist takeover of um, China, what we see are kind of two lines of immigration from China, both mainland Chinese as well as the, um, the, the um, uh, immigration from Taiwan. So we have both of these communities here in the United States. Um, in the case of, uh, so if you look at this, the bubble down there of the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association. The Dharma Realm Buddhist Association was established by a monk um, whose name just totally like just left. <laughs> uh, Xuan Hua, I believe, um, who came to the United States from Manchuria. So he came from mainland China in the um, late 50s, early 60s and established um, the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association. One of their first temples was called Gold Mountain Temple in uh, San Francisco's Chinatown. They also are the ones who own the City of 10,000 Buddhas up in Ukiah, um, the, the Dharma Realm Buddhist University, um, and they have centers across North America. <clears throat> the other two circles I have here, Fo Wan Shan, Shilai Temple, and the Dharma Drum, those are groups that are coming from Taiwan. These groups um, were mostly established by charismatic monks in the um, late 1800s or through the mid uh, uh, the mid 1900s. <laughs> Sounds like so long ago, but it really wasn't. <laughs> um, and most of these are what are usually referred to as humanistic Buddhist groups, which means that they're they're very concerned with um, engaged Buddhism or finding ways to uh, do. Um, sort of uh, social outreach to, um, uh, uh, you know, natural disasters, um, helping at hospitals, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you'll notice that I have a connection here between Chan or Zen and Pure Land, and that's because in China, the distinction between Pure Land Buddhism and Zen Buddhism is not the same as it is in Japan. Most uh, Chinese Buddhist schools uh, in the present moment will have um, both uh, Zen meditation practices as well as Pure Land recitation practices. So before the pandemic, for example, I was at a conference at um, Dharma Drum in Taiwan um, and uh, they took us on a tour of the, the university campus and there was both a meditation hall as well as a Buddha name recitation hall. And all of the monks and nuns who were there, whenever they would see us, uh, they would greet us by saying Yenfo, which is the Chinese version of Namu Mira Butsu. So they have a clear Zen lineage, but also Pure Land Buddhism is embedded within that practice. So that distinction that we see in Japan doesn't doesn't really um, uh, doesn't really work in the Chinese context. Before I go on, any uh, quick questions? Cool.
Um, okay, so Vietnam and Korea I have real, real quick. Vietnam is a bit complicated. <laughs> um, Vietnam, uh, because of where Vietnam is geographically, um, it inherits both Theravada and um, uh, Mahayana uh, practices. Um, the dominant form of Buddhism in Vietnam prior to the communist takeover was a mixture of Pure Land, Zen, and um, what in China is called Hua Yen, the Flower Ornament Sutra uh, practices, uh, and in, especially in the South, sort of infused with uh, Theravada monastic practices. Um, since the Chinese, I'm um, sorry, since the communist takeover of uh, Vietnam, the dominant form of Buddhism in both in Vietnam and amongst uh, refugees outside of Vietnam are uh, Zen lineages. And y'all probably know the most famous of these, which would be Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh has uh, communities, uh, well, he's, he's passed away, but his communities, his legacy lives on in communities across the United States. The other interesting thing about Vietnamese Buddhism in this in this country, again, is the geographic spread of where folks show up. When the refugee crisis happened, the United States State Department knew we had to accept refugees because we were responsible for a lot of what happened in Vietnam. Um, but they also didn't want any one state to have to um, absorb all of the refugees that were coming. So the State Department very explicitly said that every state had to take a certain number of refugees proportionate to its population. So as a result, Vietnamese refugees were spread out literally across the country. And for a while, um, this meant that you know families were separated from one another, communities had a hard time uh, creating, uh, uh, creating new communities and so on and so forth. By the end of the um, 20th century, that starts to change. And what we see is actually a lot of folks moving around the country, but then establishing new Vietnamese communities, as well as uh, Laotian and um, other Southeast Asian communities in you know, really interesting parts of the country. Uh, a lot of folks, for example, were attracted to the meatpacking industry in Nebraska and Kansas. So we actually see really large um, Vietnamese uh, communities in the Midwest and the Plain States, which is um, just an interesting fact of immigration patterns. <clears throat> um, Korea and Korean Buddhism has a pretty long history in the United States. Um, there were Korean um, immigrants who came to Hawaii around the same time as Japanese immigrants did in the 1800s. Um, but for the most part, the majority of Korean Americans are Christian. Um, the last time I checked, um, in Korea itself, it's about 50-50 uh, Buddhists and Christians, but it's something like 90% of Korean Americans are, are um, Christians. So the, the Korean Buddhist uh, communities in the United States are actually rather small. Um, a little plug, we have a, um, a special lecture happening on uh, April 12th. <laughs> here at the Institute of Buddhist Studies with Sharon Sa, who was a, um, uh, uh, it was yours. <laughs> Seattle University. She's at Seattle University. She'll be here giving a lecture. She's done a lot of really interesting work on Korean American Buddhism. Um, so I would say find out, you know, uh, find, search her out for information more on this community. <clears throat> um, I'm going to jump to Japan. Everyone loves Japan. <laughs> um, there's a lot of Japanese Buddhism in America. As I said before, the Japanese first started to arrive in Hawaii and um, depending on depending on who you ask <laughs> in the 18 uh, 60s, maybe the 1880s, um, and started to establish Buddhist communities on the islands. And then, of course, um, what happened to Hutton 25 years ago? He was established. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> in 1899 was when the first Jodo Shinshu ministers came to uh, the U.S. mainland and established what was then called the Buddhist Mission of North America and that what became the BCA later on. Um, I do want to point out that there are other Pure Land groups that were also either established then or have been established since then. Um, Jodoshu was also um, uh, uh, one of the early groups that came to the United States at this time. Since then, we also have Higashi Honganji, which is the other version of Jodo Shinshu. Um, and more recently, there have been some um, uh, sort of 
uh, uh, land groups that have popped up um, both in uh, North America as well as in England that don't have an official affiliation with any um, Japanese uh, organization. Um, Zen and Nichiren were also established really early. <clears throat> um, Nichiren is important um, to keep in mind that there's the, the Nichiren Shu, which is the sort of old um, orthodox version of Nichiren Buddhism in Japan. They have a presence here in the United States that has, goes back almost as long as the BCA. Um, in the mid 20th century, that's when SGI or Soka Gakkai started to become uh, much more popularized and um, came to the United States uh, largely through the wives of US servicemen who had served in occupied Japan after World War II. And then of course, SGI became uh, much more popular among uh, a wide diversity of people like the great late Tina Turner. Um, if you all don't know Tina Turner, SGI Buddhist. <laughs> um, and a book just came out. Um, uh, a religious biography of Tina Turner. I would highly recommend it. Um, of course, there's all kinds of Zen. Zen's all over the place. <laughs> we can we can talk more about Zen if you like. A lot of the popularization of Zen, of course, comes from D.T. Suzuki. And as Reverend um, Hirano mentioned, I, I talk about some of this in my book and the way in which uh, white Americans became interested in Zen um, and stumbled into BCA uh, communities. And then um, those folks helped establish um, uh, sort of convert Zen centers like the San Francisco Zen Center. Ooh, I can zoom in, I had no idea. Um, so another a chance for pictures <laughs> and a quick pause for questions. Classic Pure Land teaching kind of tradition that they inherited from China. Uh, uh, the book I have is the commentary on the uh, Amida Kyo. Mm -hmm. They call it Amida Kyo. Uh, I don't know proportionally how much of his teaching is on one side or the other, but I think that my perception is that there was a, a fusion of these two traditions in the yeah, I, I would say it's more, it's not so much that there was a fusion of the traditions as much as in Japan there was a, a division of the traditions. The, the normative way in which Buddhism was practiced in the Asian mainland was that a lot of uh, uh, different schools might have focused more on one particular aspect of the tradition, one particular set of texts one particular set of practices more than others, but they wouldn't have identified as uh, a sectarian, um, I only do Zen, not Pure Land. That, that sort of hard sectarianism uh, developed in uh, the post Kamakura period in Japan. Um, so, you know, from, from that point of view, I think it's, it's more helpful to think about Buddhist history just in terms of how all of these things are interwoven. Um, uh, and even though we can think in Japan of, um, uh, you know, this is a sort of hard and fast sectarianism, uh, I think a lot of that hard and fast sectarianism is also um, more rhetorical than uh, in reality. Um, it's not like, you know, um, uh, when I was in Kamakura many, many years ago, for example, you know, Kamakura is where it's the big, the big um, uh, Amida statue is. Um, and there's all kinds of temples there. And I went to one Zen temple and in the Zen temple, they had um, uh, an altar set up with Amitabha and the two Bodhisattva attendants. Um, so to, to sort of fall into that trap of you know, I'm only doing this and not that, I think ignores the lived reality of the way in which um, these practices get interwoven a lot more. Um, as far as Thich Nhat Hanh is concerned, I'm not an expert on his teachings. I do know that um, his communities are interesting because he was so popular with a wide variety of people. 
Um, and he also wrote pro prolifically both in English as well as his native Vietnamese, that there's just a lot of stuff that I think people probably only know, like a narrow slice of his teachings. Um, I, I know I certainly do, so. <clears throat> Cool. Uh, moving on to Tibet. Now, um, when we talk about Vajrayana traditions, this is again sort of what I'm saying is that there's an interconnection between these different practice traditions. Uh, Vajrayana comes from what is usually called the esoteric teachings. Esoteric Buddhism is not unique to Tibet. There's a lot of esoteric Buddhism across Central and East Asia and in uh, Japan, of course. So the two major schools of Japanese Buddhism that were um, most influential at the time of Honen and Shinran were uh, Shingon and Tendai. And both of these schools, Shingon was, was, was almost exclusively esoteric in, uh, in practice, and Tendai had a lot of esoteric practices within it as well. Um, do you all know Aaron Prophet? <laughs> Aaron Prophet, he hangs around a lot now. Aaron's um, dissertation work and his, his uh, first book is really all about the esoteric practices that we can find embedded within um, Pure Land uh, in Japan. So again, there's a lot of, of overlap within, um, with, within, the, within these traditions. And Shingonshu had a pretty sizable um, community here in the United States going back almost as old. Uh, well, in Hawaii, um, uh, pre the, the Shingon community in Hawaii actually predates the establishment of BCA. Um, Shingon has is, is, um, uh, diminished in size since World War II, but um, if there's still Shingon, which is an esoteric school of Buddhism here in the United States, but most people in America are gonna be more familiar with Tibetan Buddhism um, owing mostly to the, the meteoric popularity and rise of the Dalai Lama um, and the Tibet refugee crisis that happened after the fall of, or the invasion of Tibet by the People's Republic of China. Um, despite that, it's important to know that there's actually many different forms of Tibetan Buddhism. There are four major schools um, that I have listed here. I'm not gonna try to pronounce any of them because I always pronounce them wrong. <laughs> so I'll just let you read them. Um, the Dalai Lama himself is um, the head of the, uh, the Galupka uh, tradition in, uh, in Tibet, as well as the, uh, he used to be the political head of Tibet, um, but he was only ever the spiritual head of this one lineage. And there are these three other lineages, which are all, all four of these lineages have important um, representation here in North America. Um, sort of as a, um, uh, offshoot of Tibetan Buddhism, I would say, is the Shambhala International Organization. Shambhala is important to know they are um, a relatively well-known uh, community here in North America. It was founded by um, a former Tibetan monk named uh, Chogyam Trungpa. He was uh, trained in both the Nyingma and Kagyu lineages. Um, and established the Shambhala organization in the 1970s, um, established the Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. Um, one of his students was Pema Chodron. Um, you probably have all heard of Pema Chodron. She usually has uh, calendars for sale at um, Whole Foods Market. Um, <laughs> she's a lovely person, <laughs> but also pretty well known. Uh, Shambhala International also um, established the what is now called Lion's Roar. Lion's Roar is a magazine which, which um, and a website and um, it's pretty, uh, they're, they're out there, they're doing things. So that comes out of this uh, Tibetan context. <clears throat> Okie dokie, one more picture. There it is, <laughs> if people wanna get it. Yeah. What's esoteric practices mean? I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, really, I can't tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So esoteric practices are, you know, there, there. One example would be that there, you might um, be studying with your teacher. And he presents you with a ritual that you need to perform. 
the ritual has um, specific forms that aren't actually written down in the ritual manual that you can only learn from the teacher. Um, and it has special meanings that also aren't written down that you can only learn from your teacher. And once you're initiated into that ritual, then you're able to, to pass it on to somebody else. So there's um, a certain amount of secrecy involved. Uh, there's definitely a teacher-student relationship in um, uh, esoteric schools where you have to learn certain things from a designated person and so on and so forth. Um, similarly, in the Zen tradition, there's this idea of Dharma transmission where you get um, authorized by your teacher to be a teacher. Um, Zen isn't considered esoteric, but that basic function is much the same. Um, I would also say that a lot of the ordination rituals that we have in um, Jodo Shinshu come from a Tendai model, which also sort of assume a lot of things. So there's a lot of overlap here, but that distinction uh, and the way in which you know, you absolutely have to get initiated by your teacher into a particular ritual um, framework um, is is paradigmatic of the Vajrayana. It sounds like a black belt thing, huh? Like you get black belt from a sensei and then you get it from a certain sensei, not from an institutionalized, yeah. you know. It's like Airbender, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like Airbender, yeah. <laughs> I can always, can always trust on Reverend Jerry to <laughs> make it simple. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's an overview of all the different kinds of Buddhisms that exist, or most of them anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, present a few sort of big picture kind of things, uh, and then we'll uh, transition into a larger conversation, uh, longer conversation about um, with questions and discor uh, discussion. Um, uh, a lot of people, when um, they want me to talk about Buddhism in America, want to know how many Buddhists there are in America. This is an incredibly difficult question to answer <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, the numbers up here are from uh, a Pew Forum study that was done back in 2008. They did an update to this one. I want to say like in 2016 or 17 and the numbers were more or less the same some of the categories got changed because they did a better job of coming up with categories <laughs> quite frankly in the original one their categories for different kinds of buddhists were theravana uh, mahayana and then zen in parentheses uh, vajrayana other and then buddhist not specified these are weird categories <laughs> that don't really line up to anything in reality but you'll also notice that the numbers are so low that the the difference in percentages don't are, aren't aren't particularly meaningful um i take this number and combine it with another survey that, survey that was done around the same time um, and I'm going to guess that um, about 1% of the US population would self identify as Buddhist, um, which 1% seems like a pretty small number. But also remember, all of those Buddhist traditions that I just spent half an hour uh, running through very quickly, that 1% encapsulates that incredible diversity. And so there's a lot of stuff out there, um, even though the, the number might be relatively small. Part of the reason why it's difficult to get accurate numbers is just because of the way in which um, this question of are you a Buddhist necessarily implies that you like have decided to call yourself a Buddhist or perhaps that you've joined an organization um that kind of thing and for a lot of people who do buddhist practice they might not think about religion in that way so in some asian uh, american communities for example in addition to doing buddhist practice you might also do taoist practice or organize your life around confucian values and so there's no hard and fast distinction between different religious identities um, or you know you might have family that's it's Christian, so you go to the Christian church just because your family does, that kind of thing. So there's there's slipperiness in terms of that. There's also a large number of people out there who are spiritual but not religious, or who do yoga, and then they go to the Insight Meditation Center, they read a book by the Dalai Lama, there's, you know, there's clearly seeped in Buddhist ideas and Buddhist practices, but they, if, if the survey person calls them up on the phone and says, are you a Buddhist, they're going to say, no, I'm not religious. So how do we account for those people? 
some of these numbers come from a survey that was done um, by sociologists who basically just got the phone book out or the internet directory and called every single um, religious organization in the country, <laughs> all of the churches, temples, mosques, so on and so forth, and said, how many members do you have? Um, and then they, they compiled all that information and said, this is how many Buddhists there are. Um, that's an interesting exercise and not necessarily a bad thing, um, but calling a, a congregation and saying, how many members do you have has its own problems. <laughs> um, you know, within the BCA, for example, different temples might report membership in different ways, right? Um, if a stranger calls you on the phone and you're the member of a minority group in, you know, uh, uh, a red state <laughs> and somebody calls you up and says, how many members do you have? You might under report um, because you're, you don't want people to know how many folks are actually coming to your community. Or you might over report. You might inflate the numbers because you want to say, oh, we're really, really big. So that's uh, that can be a, a, a tricky way of getting an, an accurate number. But the good thing is, is that because those folks did that, we now can say where these Buddhist communities are located. Even if I don't know how many people are actually there, I can say that there are Buddhist communities in literally every state in the United States, um, which is pretty remarkable, I think. Again, just 1% of the population, but there's just this incredible diversity and geographic spread of Buddhism, um, not just in major urban areas. You can see lots of red around Southern California, the Bay Area, New York, and so on. But you know, you can't see it probably, but I can tell you there is a little tiny dot in North Dakota. <laughs> there are some Buddhists in North Dakota, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and of course, Hawaii is, uh, probably the most Buddhist state of all um, of all the states. There's a tremendous amount of Buddhist diversity just just in Hawaii. Anyone want to get a picture of this or get closer to get a picture of it? Can I zoom in? Ooh, I can. Neat. Oh, not very well. <laughs> So uh, the last thing I'll talk about, if this so works. What, what year is that now? 2010. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I really need new glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last thing I'll, I'll talk about has to do with um, uh, the, the different ways we might talk about Buddhism in America. Um, you know, a lot of folks will talk about Buddhism in America as being either Asian American or convert or white Buddhists. Um, other folks will talk about different schools like Zen or, or, or Jodo Shinshu or so on. Um, but I think thinking about um, what uh, I'm going to call here our spectrums um, is sometimes more helpful because then we can see sort of commonalities um, as well as differences, but see the, the ways in which we can sort of conceptualize the tradition in different ways. So one would have to be um, a sort of uh, institutional or organizational structure. There's um, some communities that have a lot of organizational structure. The BCA would be, <clears throat> would be very much more organizational structure and more ties to Japan. Um, and I and I know this because we just did the National Council meeting and we all had to have our sticks up to vote. <laughs> Lots of organizational structure, right? And also a very close tie to the Hongganji in Kyoto. <clears throat> this is different from other communities that are, are not particularly um, as rigidly organized. So a lot of insight meditation centers, they might have an insight teacher who maybe established it. Maybe he was a sort of charismatic person. But there's, they're not really connected to any other um, uh, either communities in the United States or connected to organizations back in Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, a teacher and a couple of volunteers and, and not, a, not a lot of, of organizational structure. <clears throat> um, in terms of practices, 
We can also think about um, a spectrum from uh, a focus on a single practice uh, uh, to a focus on a variety of practices. So again, in an insight meditation center, you know, they might just do meditation and that's it. <laughs> that's pretty much all you're going to do when you go to the, the meditation center. Um, they come from a Theravada context, and if you go to a different Theravada community, in addition to um, uh, mindfulness meditation, perhaps you're doing uh, merit practices, you're participating in rituals, um, you're, you're making offerings to monks, to the temple, so on and so forth, and so you have a, a, a wider variety of practices within that community. Um, and I, and I, here I'd want to emphasize the difference between uh, what we say we do and what we actually do. So in the Jodo Shinshu tradition, we don't have practice, right? <laughs> or if we do have practice, it's just saying the Nenbutsu. But we also have all of these other things that we do in terms of rituals, practices, things that you might not think of as explicitly religious um, or things that sort of overlap between the religious and the social. Everything that happens at Obon, for example, that's all part of our practice. And I would include there not just the dancing, but all of the stuff that happens behind the scenes in terms of organizing all that event, the, the food, the chicken, <laughs> all of that stuff is part of the, is part of the life and the practice of a temple. <clears throat> um, again, with community, we can also think about community being part of the life of a, of a Sangha. Within the BCA, I think community is really important. You know, the, the way in which we engage with the community, there's lots of different things for different people to do, different ways for people to be involved. Whereas again, at uh, Insight Meditation Center and some Zen centers or other communities, it might just be the, the place where you go to do the meditation and then you don't really engage with the community much beyond that. There's just that one thing that happens and there's not a lot of other stuff happening. Um, and then, of course, ethnicity is the big question where there's this belief that there are Asian communities and white communities and so on and so forth. I think looking at this on a spectrum is probably more helpful. There are definitely communities, particularly smaller um, and refugee communities that are mono ethnic, but even in those communities, what you'll often find is a variety of Asian ethnicities practicing together. If you think about the experiences of, F of refugee communities, you know, a small Burmese community might not have the resources to open its own temple, but they can go and to uh, a Cambodian temple or to a Thai temple because they're, they're all Theravada. And a lot of the rituals are gonna be happening in Pali. And so they can, they can feel a connection to that community. Um, and so that creates a sort of mono-ethnic community. Um, just looking around this room, the Jodo Shinshu in America used to be predominantly Japanese American, not so much anymore. <laughs> so we can also sort of see how things change over time. And particularly in a national organization like BCA, I think we could look at specific temples, right? Specific areas of the country and how things are different in different parts of the United States. Um, so I think that's all I had to say. I did it. <laughs> um, I, I do want to turn things over to Q&A and discussion. I will say, um, this was provided to give you just a sense of the, the general overview of the, um, of the Buddhist scene. I basically condensed, you know, 150 years of history uh, down into 45 minutes. Um, that's a lot of information, so there's a lot more that I could say. Um, I, I do want to provide some time for people to ask questions, both about this presentation as well as any uh, other questions we might have about how how can we better understand the diversity of Buddhism in America, as well as the history of Buddhism in America? Um, and just briefly, for those who might be interested, uh, Reverend Hirano mentioned the book um, that I published, The Making of American Buddhism. Um, for those who haven't read it, I'm going to assume most of you haven't read it. <laughs> the book is um, uh, primarily about a history um, about the Berkeley Buddhist Temple, which is just right next door. During the 1950s, uh, a young Buddhist association at the Berkeley Temple um, began publishing um, 
uh, a magazine called the Berkeley Busse, and they were also engaged in a lot of activities to help promote uh, Buddhism in the United States in English, both for the Jodo Shinshu Japanese American community, but also as outreach outside of that community. Um, as a result, they attracted a lot of attention. People like D.T. Suzuki, Jack Kerouac, not Cornfield Kerouac this time, um, would come to the temple and learn about Buddhism. And then those folks went on to um, popularize Buddhism in sort of mainstream white American culture. Um, what I tried to do in the book is to sort of dial things back a little bit and say, you know, the only reason why it's, it's possible for Buddhism to become popular in the later half of the 20th century is because of this earlier generation of work that predominantly Jodo Shinshu Japanese Americans did um, through the first part of the 20th century since they were here for so long. Um, so that's sort of the heart of, of that book. Um, and hopefully they still have copies of the bookstore. <laughs> uh, if not, you can easily get it online. Um, but at this point, I'll just turn things over to, to Q&A. Again, if people have questions, not just about this presentation, but really about anything, I'm happy to entertain them.